As we gather on now, Lord, we pray that you would give us understanding. We pray, O oh Lord, that your spirit would illuminate the text for us, illuminate our hearts, help us to understand, and not only to understand, but to apply. We pray for our children who are present, not only the children who are outside the womb, but for the children who are also inside the womb. We pray for their salvation, O oh Lord. We pray that our, uh, our faithfulness, our, our, our coming together to, to worship you despite opposition, despite mandates that would make it very difficult to do so otherwise, we pray that that would be a testimony unto them for the days that lay ahead for them. And we pray that in your time they would believe savingly in Christ. Oh Lord, use this time to glorify Christ and to strengthen your people under your service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, if you have your Bible with you, please turn to John chapter 12. We're going to be in John chapter 12, verses 27 to 34 today. John chapter 12, verses 27 to 34. If you were to do a, a Google search for the definition of the word glory, the primary definition it would give you is this, quote, high renown or honor won by notable achievements, end quote. The term glory is commonly used in reference to uh, achievements that people have made or will make or strive to make. We talk about glory, for example, in sports. Uh, Michael Jordan, one of the greatest players ever, uh, once had a commercial in which he said, uh, it's about taking everything you've been given and making something better. It's about work before glory. And of course, he's talking about championship glory there. We might talk about glory in reference to movie stars or anyone who's famous for doing something great for all the world to see. We talk about glory in reference to war. Uh, there's actually a book out there titled uh, The Glory of War, The Way to Historical Immortality. And indeed, we do speak of historical conquerors as having uh, this military glory, nationalistic glory. In the ancient Roman world, the perception of the public was that the hanging gardens of Babylon uh, were uh, a, a, the most glorious human design. Uh, according to Wikipedia, quote, they were described as a remarkable feat of engineering with an ascending series of tiered gardens containing a wide variety of trees, shrubs, and vines resembling a large green mountain constructed of mud bricks, end quote. But here's the thing. With all these types of glory that we've talked about, it comes and goes. It comes and goes. Sports stars rise to the top and they go. Sometimes they go out, we say they go out in a blaze of glory, right? But sometimes they don't. Sometimes they stick around a little bit too long, hoping to get another taste, one more taste of the glory of winning a championship. Either way, sports stars come and go. Hollywood stars come and go. Their accomplishments come and go. Nations come and go. Their glory is just fleeting. And the hanging gardens of Babylon, their glory is also gone. Those gardens are no longer there. But there is a glory that will never end. And that is the glory that Jesus sought for his heavenly Father through his death on the cross. Indeed, that is a glory that has only increased over time. It was glorious when it happened, and it has increased over time, even to this day, every time a sinner is drawn to Christ and reconciled to God through Christ's substitutionary death. And of course, the number of conversions increase every day, and so does His glory, therefore. As we continue our study of the Gospel of John today, the day in which this is going to happen, the crucifixion, the glory of God revealed in the cross, is coming near. The 12th chapter is where John started to record the events that took place during Passover week, the week in which Christ would be nailed to a cross where he died. But this has also been a chapter that has focused on the theme of devotion, the chapter started by showing us the devotion of Jesus' followers, specifically of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. 
uh, that was immediately contrasted with the devotion of Judas, which was really a devotion that was just unto himself. It was played out through a, a devotion to money. And we were then shown the masses of crowds around Jerusalem who welcomed Jesus so excitedly because they were devoted to. They had a devotion to. They were devoted to a Messiah, the coming of a Messiah, who would establish an earthly kingdom, who would free national Israel from Roman occupation. And when Jesus didn't live up to their expectations, we know what happened. By the end of the week, they would all fall away. Not only would they all fall away, but they would be calling for his murder. Why? Because they were still devoted to their idea of what the Messiah should be and what the Messiah should do. Their political purposes remained in place, and their devotion to those political purposes remained unchanged. Now, in the previous passage, Jesus spelled out what devotion unto Him, what true and acceptable devotion unto Him must look like. He said, he who loves his life loses it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it to life eternal. If anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. That's what true devotion to Christ looks like. Uh, this past week, I came across a wonderful quote by a theologian and hymnist from England uh, who lived in the 1800s uh, named Octavius Winslow. And his quote wonderfully captures what Jesus was saying about true and acceptable devotion unto him. Winslow wrote, quote, no two affections can be more opposite and antagonistic than love to God and love to the world. It is impossible that they can both exist with equal force in the same bosom. The one or the other must be supreme. They cannot occupy the same throne, end quote. And of course, that's why Scripture warns us that you cannot be friends with God and friends with the world because they are going in opposite direction. One of the things that happened in the previous passage was that some Greeks came looking for Jesus, and Jesus responded to this by saying, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And we saw that that was a clear reference to a statement made in uh, in Daniel chapter 7, a prophecy made in Daniel chapter 7, uh, that it was about to be fulfilled. Daniel 7.14 tells us what would happen to this one who was called the Son of Man. Daniel 7.14 says, And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom, that all the people's nations and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed." But his kingdom would not be, what we saw is that his kingdom would not be established the way that earthly kingdoms are established. It wouldn't look like an earthly kingdom. It would be a spiritual kingdom, which would not be established by the world celebrating his life. That's how most kingdoms are established, with a celebration of whoever the ruler is. But rather, his kingdom would be established with the world celebrating his death. How did Jesus feel about that? That's what our passage today is going to give us a glimpse of. The point of the passage that we'll be looking at today is that the crucifixion of Christ reveals the glory of God, and it should remind us to look to Christ and to believe in Him while we are still able. It should also remind us, anytime we think of the cross, that sin is never, ever a small matter. It's never insignificant. It might be to us, but it never is to God. So, having told his disciples that his hour had come, we're now given a glimpse into what Jesus was feeling, what he was experiencing in his emotions at this moment. So, let's start by looking at verses 27 and 28, where Jesus says this. He says, "'Now my soul has become troubled.'" And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came out of heaven. I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. In Peter's second epistle, he's talking about some of the letters that Paul has written. 
And he talks about how sometimes Scripture, some things in Scripture are very hard to understand. These are things that he says the untaught and the unstable will distort. And one of the things that is difficult for people to understand, particularly for natural man to understand, is why the cross was even necessary. After all, Paul did tell the Corinthians that the cross to the Gentiles is what? It's foolishness. But part of understanding why the cross was even necessary is found in seeing Jesus' feelings as he's getting closer to going to the cross. He says here in verse 27, my soul has become troubled. That's how he was feeling about the cross. My soul has become troubled. Now, it's very significant that this is how Jesus was feeling at this time. We can read history books about martyrs who have been killed for their faith. We can read stories about figures who have bravely been killed for this fleeting purpose or this fleeting cause. Socrates, for example, he was stoic. He was, he was filled with courage as he even drank the lethal substance called hemlock. Reformers were burned at the stake as they courageously sang hymns and praises unto God. There are countless stories of incredible courage in the final moments of life from around the globe in all kinds of circumstances. But what Jesus tells us here, as he's about to face difficult circumstances, is that his soul is troubled. He was afraid. In fact, we know Luke tells us that Jesus was so afraid of his hour that at one point on the night before his crucifixion, he was sweating literal drops of blood, a medical phenomenon known as hematidrosis. This should all lead us to ask why Jesus, who is God in human flesh, fully God and fully man, why would Jesus of all people feel such trouble and such trepidation about dying? After all, we, we understand, or, or we should understand, and Jesus certainly understood that that was the very reason He came to begin with. And yet, as the hour of His death draws near, His soul is filled with distress and anguish. Why? Is it because He was less courageous than these martyrs and other people who died for causes? No. No. Was it because of the physical abuse and torture that he would have to endure at the hands of men who hated him? You might think that to be the case if you were to watch most movies which portray his death, but no, Jesus did not fear the physical suffering that he was about to endure. Was it maybe the mocking and the humiliation that he would have to suffer before men? Again, no. He wasn't bothered by the rejection of men because he didn't live for the approval and the applause of men. Was it maybe the wounding of his heel by the serpent that he was fearing so greatly? No, he knew that Satan was a powerless foe against him. So what was it then? What was it that Jesus was feeling such trouble in the depths of his soul about? He feared what Paul describes in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, where Paul writes this, He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. What Paul is describing there is the doctrine of imputation. The doctrine of imputation. Let's start with this. Who is him who knew no sin? It's a clear reference to Jesus. Jesus didn't sin. He knew no sin. So that's talking about Jesus. Who made him to be sin? The Father did. The Father did. And how did he do that? By taking the sins of the elect. Every last one of the sins of his people, from the greatest sin to the least sin and everything in between, and putting them all, every last one of them, on Jesus now, why would the Father do that? 
Why would the Father make him who knew no sin to be sin? Why would the Father take our sin and put it on Jesus so that he could pour out his holy, just, righteous wrath against that sin? God is holy and just, which means that he must punish every last sin, the greatest, the least, and everything in between. So the imputation, which is, you might think of it as as transferring or, or crediting, the imputation of the sins of his people to Christ is the answer to questions like, how can God be both just and the justifier of his people? In other words, how can God hate sin so much and yet let his people be forgiven? How can filthy sinners like you and me stand welcomed and accepted and clean and pure before a holy God who absolutely hates sin and will not allow it into his presence? That's the question that imputation answers. In order to understand why Jesus was feeling trouble in his soul, why he was feeling distressed, maybe it would help to point out how terrified you or I should be if we had no choice but to bear God's wrath against our own individual sins. If, if you or I really understood the severity of our crimes and the severity of God's wrath against those sins, we would be absolutely petrified of the day that we will stand before God to give an account for our lives. We will be absolutely terrified because we know that his wrath is harsh, is severe, is terrible, is awful, it's relentless, but it's just. Now imagine if you had to bear not only God's wrath against your own sins, but that you had to bear also the sin of the person who is in closest proximity to you right now. We'd have some moving around, I imagine, (laughs) if that were the case. But imagine if that's what God required, for you to bear the sins of the person who's closest to you right now. You would do well to be twice as terrified as if you had to face God with your own sin. And now imagine that you would have to bear the terrible wrath of God against the sins of a couple more people. Hopefully you get the point. At at this point, you'd just be wishing that you could trade God's just and holy wrath for an eternity of simply being in excruciating pain. And now multiply that degree of wrath times hundreds of millions. This is exactly why Jesus felt trouble in his soul. What troubled his soul is the fact that he would bear the sin and endure the terrible, awful wrath of God against the sins of every person who will spend eternity in the presence of his glory in heaven. Every person. That's the only way that they can get into heaven. How many is that? How many people is that? We don't know. It's a, it's a number too great to be counted, a number only God knows. But this is what troubled Jesus' soul. Who would know the severity and the awfulness of God's wrath against sin better than Jesus knew? Nobody would know it better than Jesus knew. He's, he's God incarnate. Of course he knew how awful and how terrifying it was. And that, friends, is why he felt trouble in his soul about the arrival of of his hour. He continued to feel trouble in his soul as the week continued. We know from the other gospel accounts that he felt so much trouble in his soul on the night of his betrayal that he went alone to the garden of Gethsemane to pray where he pled with God the Father saying, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. That cup was a reference to God's holy wrath being poured out on the sin that he was to take upon himself, the sins of his people. Now, it's very important that we see in in an application sense, it's very important that we see how Jesus dealt with the trouble that he experienced in his soul. 
as he was distressed because he sets an example for us in all things, doesn't he? If we can understand how he felt courage and the resolve to press on and to go forth despite the trouble he was feeling in his soul, then we too can face our fears and our anxieties the way that he did. And we don't have nearly as much to be afraid of as he did. What we must see here is that Jesus found the courage to press on and to go forth by trusting in the Father's perfect, holy will for him. Jesus spent his entire life following and trusting in the Father's perfect will for his life. He had never once strayed for even one half of a nanosecond from following the Father's will perfectly. And with that being the case, abiding in and trusting in the Father's will was the only way he had ever gone, and it was the only way he ever wanted. In other words, Jesus had the same commitment to trusting God's will for him in his hour of death as he had had throughout his entire life. And this is important for us to understand because we too can find comfort in knowing that we can trust God's will for us, both in life and in death. Jesus' motivation was the glory of God, the glory of God the Father. He says, Father, glorify your name. And our motivation in life, death, joy, suffering, likewise, must be the glory of God. That was Christ's chief end. And you, friends, if you are in Christ, what is your chief end? What is the ultimate purpose for which you exist? The Westminster Shorter Catechism gives us a beautiful, succinct answer to the first question of the catechism. What is the chief end of man? And the answer is, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Friends, this is the primary purpose that you were saved. That is the number one reason God showed mercy to you, so that he would be glorified in your salvation. Now, somebody might say, well, the purpose of, of my salvation is uh, so that God would spare me from uh, God's wrath in hell. And that is indeed one purpose in God pouring out his grace on us. But the primary purpose of our salvation, the reason that sits at the top of the list above everything else, is that we may glorify God both in life and in death, should the Lord tarry in his return. Jesus knew that his crucifixion would bring glory to God the Father. This is what gave him the courage to face whatever may come, to face whatever laid ahead in the coming days. And if this is your motivation, and if you trust that God is sovereign over every one of your circumstances, that He has indeed ordained them, first and foremost for His glory, and secondly, for our good, then you too can press on despite the trouble or the sense of anxiety or the sense of distress that you might be feeling in the depths of your soul about what is to come. In the case of Jesus, what he was saying here is something about his devotion. And in a chapter that focuses on the theme of devotion, it's good to see what Jesus himself was supremely devoted to. What was it? Jesus' supreme devotion was the glory of God, even if that meant suffering, even if it meant losing his life. And that is a beautiful thing for us to see and to, to wrap our minds around, that Jesus was more devoted to glorifying the Father than he was to saving his own life. And to see that this comes immediately after Jesus told us what true devotion to him looks like. He who loves his life loses it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it to life eternal. Jesus did not love his life so much that it came before glorifying the Father. His devotion to God's glory 
is what gave him the courage to press on. His understanding of God's sovereignty, the Father's sovereignty, the Father's will for him, and his desire to glorify God in whatever circumstances may come. And friends, if you are short on courage, you too may gain courage to press on by loving God's glory more than you even love your own well-being. How's that for a gut check? It's a gut check for us, isn't it? It's also a heart check. To, to what or whom? This is the question that, that we've been asking through this whole chapter. To what or to whom are you supremely devoted? The flesh's inclination is self. The Spirit's inclination is God yeah. and the glory of God. The problem that many of us face is that we know in our minds what the right answer is supposed to be when we're asked what are you supremely devoted to? We know it up here, right? We've all got it up here. But when the rubber hits the road, when times get hard, what do we find out? Our hearts don't have it so well. Our hearts haven't figured it out nearly as well as our minds have. And so we feel trouble. We feel distress. What are you supposed to do when that happens? Preach to your heart. Preach to your heart. Preach truth to your heart. Recite Scripture. Remind your heart of God's attributes. Remind your heart of God's sovereignty. Remind Him that He's all wise. Remind Him, remind your heart that God is working all things together to grow you in Christ's likeness. And get into the habit of knowing how to do that, knowing how to preach to your own heart before trouble comes, so that when trouble comes, you'll know how to deal with the flood of emotions that come with it. If you're going to learn how to preach to your heart in a moment of distress, that's like seeing somebody who's being attacked and trying to show them some self-defense moves as they are being beaten up. How wise would that be if you had the chance to show them those same moves before that might have saved them? It's the same with your heart. Learn to preach to your heart. Get in the habit of preaching to your heart. Memorize scripture that you can recite to your heart when trouble comes. Jesus' prayer was, Father, glorify your name. And I have to think that it was probably very much to the surprise of those who were nearby. This prayer was immediately answered in an audible voice that came from heaven. John tells us, then a voice came out of heaven, I have both glorified it and I will glorify it again. Whenever God spoke audibly for, for everybody to, to hear during Jesus' ministry, it was always to express his approval of Jesus. Matthew 3.17 tells us that at Jesus' baptism, God's voice came down from heaven saying, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And then we see something similar in Matthew 17.5. Jesus has taken Peter and James and John up to the mount where they have witnessed Jesus' transfiguration where they heard God's voice from heaven there as well saying to them, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Even they needed to be reminded of that. We do too. And now here in John chapter 12, God's voice is once again expressing approval of Jesus. I have both glorified it, speaking past tense, expressing approval of Jesus' life. And he says, and will glorify it again. That's future tense, expressing approval of the way that he would be glorified in Jesus' death. God was glorified from the moment that Christ was born when the, the choir of angels sang glory to God in the highest, and he would be glorified in every single moment of Jesus' perfect, blameless, sinless life, even until the gruesome, violent, indeed barbaric death that Christ would die. Now, a lot of people find that to be a very hard pill to swallow, that Jesus had to die this barbaric death. There were many well-known pastors and authors 
who started to part way with Christian orthodoxy about 15 years ago by writing books and articles and blogs where they were arguing that the suffering involved in the crucifixion was unnecessary and that it really turned God into some kind of barbaric moral monster. But the question is, the question that I would have asked them if I could ask them a question, is who are we to judge God? Who are we to judge what He does? Who are we to judge what He requires? Who are we to say that God could have and and indeed should have chosen a more palatable, clean way to do things? God is the one who's all wise. And with that said, our question should never be, why, why did God do it this way or do it that way? The question is simply, what does God's Word say was God's will? And in the case of the cross, it was His will that Christ should die. In fact, it was plainly, clearly God's plan from eternity past. Hebrews 13, 20 tells us that the Father and the Son entered into a covenant of redemption in eternity past, before the foundation of the world, something we can't even wrap our minds around. It was so long ago. Eternity past. We can't even say eternity past. That's kind of an oxymoron. But we recognize that it was before the foundation of the earth, it was before time even began, that this covenant of redemption was established between the Father and the Son, according to Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20. And nothing would stand in the way of God's plans coming to pass. Absolutely nothing. God is always, always, always faithful to His covenants, and He is glorified by them. And that's what we're going to see as the passage continues to unfold. Let's look at verses 29 to 34. So the crowd of people who stood by and heard it were saying that it had thundered. Others were saying, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered and said, this voice has not come for my sake, but for your sakes. Now judgment is upon this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. But he was saying this to indicate the kind of death by which he was to die. The crowd then answered him, we have heard out of the law that the Christ is to remain forever. And how can you say the son of man must be lifted up? Who is this son of man? The response of the crowd to hearing this voice from heaven was to assume that an angel had spoken to Jesus. They didn't recognize the voice of God. That's one thing that we should see there. But Jesus quickly corrects their thinking in order that they would immediately understand that the voice of God was not for His benefit, but it was for their benefit. Why did they need to hear it? Jesus goes on to explain, saying two things in verse 31. First, now judgment is upon this world, and secondly, now the ruler of this world will be cast out. These are two ways that the death of Christ on the cross would glorify God the Father. First, it would judge the world. How so? To understand this, we have to understand the terrible condition of the whole world. Everywhere you go around the world, sin dominates humanity. It's not exclusive to our culture. It's not exclusive to to Western culture or to the Western Hemisphere or to the Eastern Hemisphere. It is everywhere around the world we see sin dominating man. Men bow before pathetic powerless idols everywhere you go. The world is in open rebellion against God. It not only defies God, but it celebrates and applies, uh, applauds the defiance of God. The cross shows us God's response to that, to that rebellion, to that sin. The cross shows us that God takes sin very seriously. The world would have us believe that what God calls evil is actually good and what God calls good is actually evil. But the cross reminds us that God alone 
is qualified to define what is good and what is evil. And he alone is qualified to decide that all sin must be punished. The cross reveals just how much God hates what the world loves and what the world celebrates. The cross also reveals how defiant humanity is toward God. Think about this for a second. Why was Jesus, of all people, why was Jesus crucified? After all, he lived a perfectly blameless, sinless life. Why should he die the type of death that was reserved for only the most wicked and the vilest of sinners? And the answer, friends, the reason they crucified him was because he was blameless. It's because they hate righteousness. The world hates righteousness because it hates the source of righteousness, and that is God. The world hates God. That's why Jesus was chosen to be crucified by the people over Barabbas, who was a murderer and insurrectionist. If you want to understand exactly how wicked, how vile, how evil man is by nature, if you want to understand how great humanity's hatred of God is, you don't need to look any further than the cross. Secondly, Jesus says God would be glorified in the way that Jesus' death would cast out the ruler of this world. That's a reference to Satan. It's a reference to the devil. Satan reigned through provoking people, but not causing people, by the way. We don't get to blame the devil for our sins. We bear the guilt for our own sins. Satan reigned through provoking people to sin and through temptation to sin. But Jesus' death would not only result in our forgiveness before God, it would also free us from bondage to sin. The term that Luther had for the unregenerate man is that his will was in bondage to sin. It was a prisoner. It was chained to sin. It could not break free. But what Jesus is saying is that because of what happened on the cross, Satan would no longer have any power over his people. We would not only be freed from the penalty of sin, but we would be freed from the power of sin. Yeah. Donald Gray Barnhouse says this. He says, quote, when a person becomes a Christian, he is delivered from Satan's grasp, and the chains of sin which had shackled him are instantly broken, end quote. That is to say that when God freed us from the penalty of sin. He also freed us from the, substi- from, the, from the power of sin through Christ's substitutionary death. Colossians 2.15 says this. Paul writes that when he, Jesus, had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. How did he do that? At the cross. Through the work of Jesus on the cross. Now, a third way that God would be glorified in Jesus' work on the cross is found in verse 32, where Jesus says this. He says, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. Through his work on the cross, Jesus would demonstrate his power to draw defiant, rebellious sinners to himself and to reconcile them once and for all unto God. Now, this word draw, it's the same word for draw that gets translated draw back that we saw back in uh, John chapter 6, verse 44, when Jesus said, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Now, that is a word, the word draw indicates strength. It indicates a forceful action rather than a, a wooing attempt at, at persuading. Like, you know, I, I tried to, to draw my wife to, to love me once upon a time, to, to, to go out on a date with me or something, you know? That's not what draw means in this context. It's not a wooing attempt at persuading. See, the, the temptation that many people have when they see this verse is to see it as Jesus saying that he's going to draw absolutely everybody to himself. But what we need to understand is that everybody who's drawn to Christ comes. And yet, there are many, many verses that remind us of the reality of hell 
and judgment that await many. The doctrine of imputation is found in both the Old Testament and the New. And when we understand this doctrine, we understand that Jesus only bore the sins of the elect, of God's people. In Leviticus, we see a picture of this. We see a picture of imputation, what it looks like, who is covered by the atonement. In Leviticus, we learn that God instructed the high priest to lay his hands on a scapegoat, and that that goat was supposed to bear the sins of a certain group of people, a specific group of people, and take those sins away. Leviticus 16, 21 says this, then Aaron shall lay both of his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the iniquities of the sons of Israel and all their transgressions in regard to their sins. And he shall lay them on the head of the goat and send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a man who stands in readiness. Friends, that is a picture of what happened on the cross. That is a foreshadowing of the atonement that Christ would make. Only the sins of those who were in the camp of Israel would be atoned for by this scapegoat. And likewise, in Christ's atonement, only the sins of those who would be saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, would be atoned for. The gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Jesus teaches in Matthew 7, 14. This, along with so many other verses and passages, make it very, very clear that not all people will be drawn to Christ. Because when one is drawn to Christ, they will come to Christ. And they will come not against their will. They'll come willingly. Right after saying that no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day, Jesus continues in verse 45 of John chapter 6 by saying this. He says, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Everyone. There are none who are drawn to Christ who don't come, who aren't saved. There are many, however, who do not come to him. And if Christ doesn't atone for their sins, if Christ doesn't take their sins upon himself, who will? They will. They will bear their own sins before God. So what does Jesus mean when he says, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself? Let's first understand that it should, it should cause everyone, every single person on the face of the earth to repent and to believe because his death on the cross declares the necessity of believing in him. It declares that God takes sin seriously and that God will judge every sin. And yet because of sin, this is not what the cross does for most people. They avoid the light because they love their sin. They refuse to believe in Jesus because suppressing the truth in their own unrighteousness allows them to feel, just for a time, like they're the ones who set the rules that they're going to live by. It's defiance. So again, what does Jesus mean when he says, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself? He means that he would draw all types of men to himself, all types of people to himself. The rich, poor, young, old, Jew, Gentile, lawmakers, lawbreakers, men, women, people from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. These people, according to the four living creatures and the 24 elders from Revelation 5, 9, and 10, would be made by Jesus to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. In the mind of many Jews, the idea of being lifted up meant being exalted in an earthly way. And Jesus would indeed be lifted up, and he would indeed be exalted. It just wouldn't look like what they had imagined it would look like. His exaltation would actually look like humiliation and degradation. 
That's why John makes sure that we, as his readers, understand. He was saying this to indicate the kind of death by which he was to die. The Jews simply did not understand the cross. This passage ends up with these people being just completely confused. They say, we have heard out of the law that the Christ is to remain forever. And how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is the Son of Man? They could not be more confused. They were expecting the Messiah to come and establish an earthly kingdom. That was their understanding of the Davidic covenant. God had promised David, I will raise up your descendant, that's Jesus, after you, who will come forth from you, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. That's what they're expecting, but they think it's going to be an earthly kingdom. Jesus is that descendant, but he did not come to establish an earthly kingdom. He came to establish a spiritual kingdom, one that a person would need to be born again in order to see, as Jesus told Nicodemus back in chapter 3. Yes, the Messiah would most certainly establish his kingdom, but he would also suffer greatly in doing so. Isaiah reveals that the Messiah would be a suffering servant. And he would write, Isaiah would write that he will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted. That's Isaiah 52, 13. But then the very very next verse tells us what this lifting up and this exaltation was going to look like. Verse 14 says this of the Messiah. It says, his appearance was marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. This is almost undoubtedly, by the way, the passage that Jesus was referring to when he said that he would be lifted up. But because these Jews had different expectations for the Messiah, because they wanted a Messiah with a small m who would establish an earthly kingdom, they just end up asking, who is the Son of Man? They are willfully and woefully lost in the darkness. The crucifixion of Christ should remind us to look to the cross and to believe while we're still able. And his death should remind us that sin is never, ever a small matter. Have you been drawn to Christ? Do you believe that he is who he says he is? Do you believe that he's God in human flesh? and that he lived a a sinless life? Do you believe that he willingly suffered a gruesome, barbaric death so that you may have life? Do you believe that there is salvation in no other name but his? And do you believe that every single one of your sins that you have committed or that you will commit was imputed, credited, transferred, to Christ on your behalf, and that in exchange, He covered you with His own perfect righteousness. His perfection was imputed to you, and your severe lack of perfection, all of us, was imputed to Him. Do you believe that? See, if you believe these things, and if you believe these things savingly, They are such a comfort to know that our sin is no longer on us, but that we are covered by Christ's righteousness in a very real sense. What a great comfort. If you believe these things, though, you must know that just as Christ had a cross to bear, you too will have a cross to bear. The world will hate you just as it hated him. But the question is, will you willingly suffer for his glory just as he willingly suffered for your salvation? Just as to be at peace with the devil and the world and the flesh is to be at war with God, so too to be reconciled to God means to be at war with the devil, the world, and the flesh. God will be glorified in that battle, and he will supply the grace of and the strength that you need. So do not respond to worldly trials and afflictions with distress or despair. 
Respond instead by entrusting your life and indeed your death to the will of God. Your life is not your own. Therefore, glorify God in your salvation by being supremely devoted to him, to Jesus and his glory. Remember that because Jesus was troubled on the cross for your sins, you don't need to be troubled on judgment day. Jesus bore all the guilt and all the shame of all who would believe in him on the cross just as surely as you now bear his righteousness before God if you have believed in him. Consider that privilege. Just think about it. Set your mind on it. And consider that it is such a great privilege to be able to glorify God and that the privilege of glorifying God is better and infinitely more profitable than the privilege of living in comfortable, unshaken, self-indulgent lifestyles. If you have truly repented and believed in Christ, then take heart, friends, and be courageous with your faith knowing that he is with you, that he is for you, and nothing, no trial, no affliction, no sin, not even death, can separate you from the love of God, which is found in Christ Jesus. His glory is not only worth living for, it's also worth dying for, if that's the way it has to be. And so, may he be greatly glorified in your lives and in your salvation as you submit your ways to him. Let's pray. Our most gracious Father, we do thank you for Jesus, for his perfect obedience to your will. Being credited to us is a mystery so great our, our minds can't fully understand it. And yet that is what your word reveals. And so we thank you and we praise you for loving us so much that you would show us grace and mercy. A grace and mercy that we could never deserve, that we could never earn, that on our own we never would have sought or wanted. And yet in your great love, you saved us by your grace. You gave us faith to believe, and you provided what you require, the perfect substitute to stand in our place before you and to bear our sin and to credit us with his own righteousness. Oh, Lord, help us to live in light of these truths, knowing that our lives are not our own and that there's nothing more worth living for than your glory than your glory. And if you were glorified in the cross, then give us the courage to preach the cross and to proclaim the cross before men. Knowing that it may offend, but knowing that it's the means by which you save. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.